This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome to this week's Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are back here in the studio. We're going to have a little bit of fun this year because, I mean, this show, specifically because of the... uh, what I do at the end, at this time of year is I actually share kind of what I've been looking at or thinking about what are those innovations that have the biggest, um, I don't know, inspiration or ones that I am most excited about. So I've collected up this list of uh, innovations that I want to share with you on today's show. Now, these are all things that are going to have, um, you know, broader impact, uh, things that are kind of outside of the mainstream. Now, uh, over my 25-year history in the innovation uh, world or career, um, I've spent a lot of time, you know, tracking those innovations that become wildly successful and then those that just become, you know, total duds that actually, you know, go nose down. Now, I could sit here and share with you um, the innovations that I've worked on that ended up you know, going nose down in, in, in the dirt. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, bad choices for products. Some cases, uh, management teams that uh, just didn't quite get it and uh, decided to uh, bail on something that I thought was interesting. Um, if you go back through my more recent history when I was CTO at HP, I'm sure you could find lots of uh, those kinds of innovations where they were both successful and one's not so successful. And that's part of the, the I don't know what's called call it, the fun or the excitement in the, in the innovation space, but it is about how to, you know, try, ha, you know, have the guts to try, be that, do that experimentation and be willing to fail. And the real test for failure, though, is are you willing to fail publicly? Are you willing to go out there and go big and bold about what your idea is and then just have the whole thing just, you know, literally crater right on top of you. You know, so there's there's multiple failure modes, but I'll tell you, it's kind of like being on that high wire act, no net, all big audience, and you're going to wing it. Now, in this case, the innovations that I want to talk about today, and I've got a whole series of them here, is uh, those innovations that are been announced in the last oh, year or so. Most of them, I think, in fact, all of them are not available yet, but my belief that they're going to have some significant impact over the next year or two. So you're not too late. These are some really kind of at the the very pointy end on the innovation space. So these are ones that you can keep a track of if they're as uh, interesting to you. Now, these, why do I classify these as interesting? I think they're interesting because I think they're also inspirational because they've gone and they're doing something that, in some cases, others have never tried, never thought about. It's a unique twist on the problem or the opportunity. And, uh, and therefore, it's, it's really about that ingenuity that really has me excited about what some of these um, innovations could really turn out to be. So, so what I have is, is the six innovations I am most excited about. So these are ones, and I've got them in kind of a rank order. We're going to start at number six. We'll work our way to number one. But these are the six innovations that I am so much so excited about. These are the things that I'm tracking. If I had to, you know, I went through my entire list. These are the ones, again, that I'm, uh, that I, I'm, I'm intrigued. And in fact, maybe in a future show, um, bringing on some of the inventors of these, because I think part of this is also the the ingenuity that went into creating these that caused someone to look at the problem in a unique and different way that then resulted in this innovation. So let's take a look at the first one. So number six. Now, this is a drone. We've all seen drones before. Drones have been out there for quite some time. They have, uh, you know, they're using them for photography. They're using them for oversight of, uh, you know, taking nice photographs of, you know, uh, resort areas and, you know, fun videos or extreme sports. We've seen, we've seen them all, right? However, this drone is somewhat different. It is, yes, a drone, 
But what is unique is, is about the material that you use it. So in this case, if you look at this drone, and uh, and I'll have pictures posted, and we'll have the video posted up over at Kill Innovation. So if you're on just listening, you can go check out the images. But what you're seeing here are these kind of what looks like banded colors in the drone. What that is, is they've taken the cavity of the drone and they've packed it with food. They've made the entire drone out of balsa wood. And the material that wraps the drone can also be used. So they refer to this as an edible drone. And it's called Pouncer. And it was designed specifically for disaster relief or developing countries and getting food and supplies into the remote area. So literally, when this drone lands in, you tear the drone apart, you have access to the food, which again, is a part of the wings here, it's part of that body area. Then you take the material off of that drone and you can actually use that to make a shelter. And then the entire drone is made out of wood, which gives you wood to turn and you can, you can create a fire to create, create warmth. So this is taking a, a something that's pretty standard as a drone. We've seen lots of them. And in fact, you know, I was out, you know, holiday shopping and, and you can see drones all over the place this year. They're like just, you know, and everybody was buying drones, it seems like, uh, this year. So drones are fairly standard. But what is unique is, is how they literally designed a drone to be completely consumed. So this is a drone that has a single flight, single purpose, which is to get food into remote areas that, can, that are not easily accessible. Now, the reason why I think this is interesting and why I'm so interested in this is our work in Rwanda. The work, our work in Rwanda is in the Bugisera region. It's one of the poorest regions of Rwanda. Um, and yes, they, you know, they do have access to roads to be able to get into the capital but in some cases, um, in other parts of Africa, where you have like natural disasters and they don't have well-defined infrastructure, it takes days, even weeks to get food and supplies into areas that are hard hit by disasters. So in this case, I think this is an interesting approach to one, taking advantage of a, of a well-defined, well-proven area of innovation, but putting a unique twist on it. And in this case, um, turning it into um, a drone. Now, the next innovation, number five on my list, is uh, a wheelchair for developing countries. Again, this ties into our work in Africa. Um, we spend a lot of time there, and we, we uh, have this uh, challenge of remote health care, remote services, how do you provide support. In our case, we do for-profit investments, and at the same time, we do... Uh, uh, our uh, volunteer work, but we invest in entrepreneurs in Africa, but we also come in and do social work also, in this case, education and other things. This is what's called Safari Seat. It actually uses standard bicycle parts. So everything in this device actually is built off of standard bicycle parts. And why is that so important? It's important because Bicycles is the primary means of transportation in many developing countries. Even out in the remote villages where we operate, there's a little bike shop, a guy who repairs bikes, takes old bikes, chops them up, puts them back together again. So this is something that's well known, well understood, and well, under, and well utilized. So in this case, Safari Seat takes this concept of taking standard bicycle parts such that it's very local maintenance. One of the challenges when innovating in developing countries is around this whole challenge of maintenance. There's a lot of people who want to do really great work that come in, they, they drop in these very elegant, sophisticated innovations into these uh, developing areas. And then when they leave, that technology, that innovation, that solution may last for a year or two, but then as soon as it breaks, it gets pushed to the side because there's no access to parts, there's no access to people to repair it. You drive around in some of these areas and you literally just see buildings full of, quote, old technology or new innovations that are broken that are get shoved into these, you know, warehouses. They can't be fixed. There's no spare parts. And the people who bought them, sent them over there, meaning all good things, don't understand or, or don't appreciate the real challenges as far as 
really getting in there to uh, make sure that the innovations you deliver are sustainable, can support the activities over an extended period of time. So, so these are the first two. So, you know, number six is the, you know, the drone. So this is the drone. Its name is Pouncer for, for emergencies. And then Safari Seat, which is a wheelchair using at hand parts in order to um, solve the needs of special needs, people being able to mobility to get around. So when we come back, we're going to pick up at number four. We're going to get through all six here in today's show. These are the innovations that I find most interesting. So stay right where you're at. We will be right back. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are here in the studio. Today, we're talking about six innovations that I am most excited about. These are the innovations that I think are going to have the biggest impact over the next oh, 12 to 24 months or so. Now, these are things that are kind of not part of within the normal scope of uh, the innovations that you typically think I would follow, but ones that um, I have just become intrigued with. Not, you know, the, the basic technology or the innovation piece um, it may not be all that novel, but it's a unique twist. It's someone who's taken a look at it and just looked at it in a different way. So we've covered the first two, number six and number five. Now we're moving on to... Uh, number four. Now, number four is one that we've seen on the press a lot, which are the reusable rockets. So it started off with you know a number of the companies that have uh, gone into the space program as a for-profit business. NASA now contracts with these uh, companies um, like SpaceX and others. But now the this pace of innovation, the pace of change from Thinking back into the 1960s with the Apollo program to um, now um, with uh, these new companies and the rate that they can try and experiment with new things. Now, the reusable rocket, the concept is you take the rocket, you launch it into space to deliver supplies to the space station. The later stages of those rockets disconnects, actually returns to Earth. You know, in years bygone, they would just splash into the ocean. You'd recover it and they'd basically... Um, would not be reused. They'd be scrapped. Um, a number of the companies figured out that if they could way to, to get those rocket stages back, they could actually speed up the cycle, reduce the cost, and actually, in effect, reduce the waste. So there's been this work on these reusable rockets where you shoot them up. When that stage disconnects, it comes back down um, and lands on, on Earth or lands on a barge out in the middle of the ocean, um, whatever, depending on the company that's involved. What's interesting in this case is, is one that someone could even think that was even possible, given you got this thing falling from the sky and you're going to land it on basically a, the equivalent of a postage stamp um, out in the middle of nowhere. But also it is this whole, you know, concept of I'm going to, I'm going to be willing to try this experiment and guess what? It might fail. And guess what? It did fail very publicly. You know, we saw a number of the SpaceX rockets blow up, land, tip over before finally the SpaceX team led by Elon Musk finally got it to land, stand upright and now begin to work. As a result of that, though, I think that's been it. That is a great example that I would like to use to inspire all of us, including me, that getting out there and being willing to fail publicly is actually um, not as scary as you might think. So from that standpoint, you know, yes, you take huge risk. You could take huge um, shots to your credibility. And yes, some people, okay, Elon's unique. He's not, um, you know, he's not you or me. He's Teflon. He's made his billions, you know. Uh, but trust me, Elon and everybody, they have an ego. They want to prove themselves. They don't like taking the hits. But it's also a sign when you're really, really committed to the innovation in the form that you actually are going to get out there and try it and be willing to fail. And when it fails, 
not to give up. You're still committed. You believe it to your core that this is going to work. And then as a result of that, you get out there and, uh, you know, you keep, you keep trying. So number four on my list this year is the reusable rockets and the inspiration that it provides. And the fact that yes, it's working, it has reduced the cost. It speeds up the cycle of being able to get more rockets up there to, to serve uh, the space station, but also as a stage for us to do deep space exploration. And I am a big fan of, of space and space exploration. If you look at the technologies and innovations that we have around us each and every day, that's a result of the, uh, the space program. But also the fact that the leaders of these companies were willing to do this in a very open, very public way. They have to. If they can't hide those. And knowing that it could fail and they could get the public, you know, backlash um, of trying something and having it not work publicly. So, number four, the reusable rockets. Number three, robots. Now, these are not robots that you think about from the standpoint of the mechanicals. are going to shake your hand or cook you food or whatever. These bots are really about artificial intelligence and being able to engage in a conversation with um, customers. Now we're seeing these come online with customer service kinds of applications. Um, this being where, um, uh, you know, you may want to talk to a customer service rep, one's not available, but the kind of the common questions and common challenges are things that um, anybody or you can pretty much figure it out over time. So in this case, this particular bot is based off from a company that says, do not pay. Now, this bot is basically a bot of an attorney. <laughs> yeah, um, no, no attorney jokes. I'm not going to go there, but I'm sure we can all think up a number of uh, attorney jokes based on this. But this particular uh, robot attorney called Do Not Pay, it really is about helping people deal with legal issues. And this started off with people who were being evicted or rent disputes with landlords. But now it's gone into a number of different areas. And this example um, that I'm showing here, this is one around uh, traffic tickets. So in this particular bot, you know, the person says, hey, I got a traffic parking ticket. The bot responds and says, uh, you know, ask a basic simple question. And then we got down to, you know, hey, was your car stolen? The, the person responds, yes. And the bot says, okay, I'll be able to help you appeal this ticket. Um, and then it automatically generates the appeal uh, process for that particular locale um, for that person. So I think, you know, this is just being one example of, uh, of bots that I think are going to become pretty widespread. Uh, it's still in the very early stages of this, but I think it's going to get to the point where it's going to be very hard for you to tell when you're interacting with a bot versus when you're in a chat discussion with a customer service rep or some other area. So get prepared. You're going to be spending a lot more time talking to bots than you ever have so far in your career. Uh, just get used to it. And in some cases, because the bot never sleeps, they can run as many bots as possible so you never get stuck in a queue. This could help um, address or improve um, things such as customer care or um, getting advice or understanding uh, your rights, in this case with uh, uh, do not pay bot, uh, which is basically the attorney bot uh, here. So uh, I think bots and artificial intelligence and big data all are going to get wrapped up in it. I think the one that's going to touch the most of us are going to be these bots. These are the things that we're going to be engaging with over the next year. And it's just going to become pretty much the, uh, the standard process. So we're going to take another quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to pick up at number two of the six uh, innovations that I am most excited about. So don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. You're listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are discussing today the six innovations that I 
personally am most excited about. Um, every Sunday, we're here live on the show. You can listen to us on any of the 35 radio stations that carry our program. Um, and uh, we also then are broadcast on Saturday. When we do the show and we're in the studio, meaning we're live in the studio, or sometimes I have to do, I'll pre-record a show because of my travel or I'm at a convention or something. But when I'm live in the show, we also do uh, Facebook Live. So you can go over to Facebook and uh, watch the show. And during the commercial breaks, we actually take your questions. So, in fact, um, during the commercial break, uh, we were uh, talking through some questions around back on the drones, uh, particularly back on uh, the edible drone or pouncer, which was number six on my list. In this case, the question was, was, well, what about Amazon or DJI or any of the other drone manufacturers? Are they um, going to get into this philanthropy work? And actually, my, my opinion is, is they will not. Um, for-profit businesses run as for-profit businesses, philanthropic charities running as charities. They run, and there's always this attempt, particularly for the for-profit businesses, to try to make charities act and operate like um like a for-profit business and trust me it doesn't work i'm I'm, I'm chairman of two 501c3 charities here in the united states plus i'm a ceo at a company and i have to kind of keep myself compartmentalized so no i don't think it's probably in the best interest of amazon or dji to get into the philanthropy business however what i would hope is is that amazon dji and others in the drone business are innovating at a phenomenal rate If they would make those technologies available to companies like Pouncer and others that are trying to create drones for the philanthropic world, um, that would be phenomenal. You know, royalty free or very low cost to allow them to take the intellectual properties and embed it into these things that are going to have the impact and potentially save lives. Because there is a unique characteristics of these philanthropic drones. Um, The one... Uh, objective or the one uh, design criteria for a philanthropic drone is is it's going to go one way. I don't have to worry about it coming back. So a lot of times in the drone industry, you have to worry about making sure you got enough battery to get the drone back to you because they're very expensive. You don't want to lose one. In the case of Pouncer, I only it's a one way suicide mission. It's going to go land, crash, be used, never to return. So I can get in fact drones that can go twice the distance than a normal for-profit drone could ever hope to go. So there's unique design characteristics, which I think, me, in my opinion, needs a um, unique approach to innovation to make that happen. But I think there's a for-profit, non-profit, charity combination. And it isn't just about drones. I think there's opportunities to innovate in the charity non-profit world. In fact, go back, there's been a, a number of shows where I've talked about innovating in, in, the, in the charity world. Um, so I think this, this is a great example of where um, for-profit innovators in the drone space can help um, those creating drones specifically for the philanthropic charity disaster relief space. And I think that's an opportunity to co-innovate, which is actually so much it's so important in today's world because the cost of innovation is not getting any less. In fact, just as the pace of innovation picks up, the cost of innovation is uh, accelerating. So... So let me go to number two. Number two is an interesting technology. Now, I'm going to geek out here a little bit. I'm going to get my propeller spinning, so uh, bear with me. Um, These are what we call ambient backscatter. These little tags you can just hang up in the air actually take power from the air. Now, this isn't wireless power, so you take your phone and slap it on a magnet with no cord and it recharges. This is not what that is. Backscatter literally takes the energy that that is all around us in the form of radio waves and reformats those and turns those into uh, radio transmissions. So these technologies are going to be used in areas um, such as wireless communications in remote areas. So where you have no power, right, and you're looking to extend the reach, so take wireless, cellular, Wi-Fi, where you want to get it, you want to get it out there much, much further than you normally can, you can use these backscatter tags 
to literally bring all of that energy of those RF signals in and then push those back out. You actually create, you're creating radio waves from other radio waves is the best way I can describe it. Now, the company that particularly has developed these tags is a company called Jiva Wireless. Um, they are, they are, have won, let me get this right, oh, they're in a Phase 1 SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Grant, which is awarded here by the U.S. government. So, you know, SBIR puts out requests for general technology areas. You submit a proposal. And then um, the Small Business Innovation Research Grant actually helps you helps fund, and, and it's funded in phases, is how an SBIR grant is done. So th these guys are in phase one and have an SBIR grant, or at least the information I have here, they may be uh, further down. Um, but they can communicate, they can generate, um, using this backscatter methodology, uh, 10,000 times less power. Get that right. 10,000 times less power than current technologies for cellular Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Bluetooth, whatever. And I think this is just kind of the, 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 the cornerstone piece on uh, what is it from the standpoint of uh, where backscatter could be used. Because now if you can capture this and you're getting a little bit of efficiency, if you improve these backscatter tags, could you take energy that just naturally gets, you know, we were doing that in effect from sunlight. Sunlight is a, is a, uh, is a wave source of, of information energy being transmitted. Solar panels pick them up. Backscatter is a way to take other kinds of signals, not solar, turn them into something. You know, as we start to crack the nut on some of these kinds of interesting technologies, I think we're we're somewhat ignorant on how much energy is actually just naturally around us on any given day. And so I think this one is really interesting. These, like I said, they're in phase one of, a, of an SBIR research grant. But I think these are going to be some pretty interesting technologies around what is going to be possible. And, and think about it from the context of Moore's Law, right? Moore's Law says that we can improve... Um, CPU performance, doubling it every 18 to 24 months, right? So it's, it has this doubling effect or Moore's Law. So in today, now you've got more power in your, in your cell phone than the total computing power that put man on the moon with Apollo 11 in 1969. So apply that to backscatter. You think about, okay, they're just getting a little bit of energy out of it. But let's say they double it in a year, and then they double it in a year again. And then they double it in a year again. If they have their own equivalent of a Moore's Law from the standpoint of this constant improvement, you know, you go through 5, 10, 15 cycles of Moore's Law on this kind of a fundamental technology, and it could totally transform energy, it could totally transform communications, it could totally transform um, how we get... Um, uh, how, you know, what, what, what do devices look like? If I can pull all the energy I need out of the air by, by taking in other energy sources that are just naturally there, then what does that do from the standpoint of understanding power distribution and developing countries and remote areas that don't have access to fundamentals of electricity or broadband access or those kinds of things? So, this is one of those areas that um, I am actually very keenly uh, interested in. And so, you know, so from that standpoint, I think this is going to be one that I think is going to turn out to be um, one that I think is uh, truly uh, interesting and one that I think can uh, become one that's going to uh, lead out to um, all kinds of technologies if this, uh, if this should prove out. So we're going to hop off and take a, another quick commercial break here. We've got the number one item that I am most excited about. We're going to cover that when I come back from this uh, quick commercial break. And then uh, we're going to talk about what our summer plans are coming up for episode 13, which is, or not episode 13, season 13, which we start in the March timeframe. So 
You're not going to want to go anywhere. You're going to want to stay right where you're at, right there. And when we come back, we're going to pick up what is that number one innovation that I am most excited on. So stay right there. We'll be right back. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. Uh, before we hop in and wrap up the number one uh, innovation that I'm most excited about, I do want to give an acknowledgement to uh, the sponsor of our show. The sponsor for Kill Innovations is uh, Zoom. Uh, if you're not familiar with Zoom, Zoom is a, a video collaboration technology that delivers unbelievable video quality, unbelievable audio quality, uh, great collaboration technologies. Um, and how do I know this? I've been using it for over a year. Not only do we use it here in the studio, so when we have guests who appear on the monitors here and, and we uh, do the interviews, they all connect by Zoom and they've been doing that for over a year. But in my day job, we have actually now deployed Zoom throughout all of our sites. And it allowed our team to become much more productive. And in fact, if you look and track the number of video hours now spent between teams that are remote, it is just off the chart. And why is this the case? Why is Zoom so much better? Well, in my mind, I've used all of them out there, all the video collaboration technologies out there. And Zoom is the first one that doesn't suck. So, and I'm not the only one, right? Gartner just recently put them in the magic quadrant. So if you're a business, uh, even small business up to an enterprise, you should be checking them out. You want to go try Zoom out. So how do you go check them out? You can give it a try with a free account that allows you to meet with up to 50 people. You can have 50 people at the same time participate in a video collaboration effort that you're doing and trying it out with this free uh, Zoom account. So visit killerinnovations.com slash Zoom to find out more. So what is the number one innovation that I am most excited about? Now you're all probably sitting at the edge of your seat. You're all wondering what it is, right? It's actually whatever innovation you're excited about. Now you're going to say, oh, that's a letdown, Phil. I was expecting something really intriguing, really exciting. And I'll do a future show on a couple of the ones that I'm really um, really, really excited about. But this is teeing up the fact that you all see a lot of innovations, whatever your job is. You know, we have listeners who are involved in consumer package retail. We have listeners that are in, on the show of medical. Uh, we have listeners of the show that are Silicon Valley. We have uh, listeners of the show who are in philanthropic nonprofit trying to innovate in their uh, particular area. It's whatever innovations you find important. Now, what I'm interested in doing, though, is hearing what is the one innovation that you are most excited about. What is that killer innovation, that idea, or that innovation that's out there? It doesn't have to come from you. It can be something you read about. It could be something that you're tracking. And in some cases, it may be something you wish you had, but you don't have yet. And what I want you to do is to share that, with not only with me, but the the listeners of the show so here's what we're going to do we're going to tie this in to um the uh the the uh the celebration for season 13. so in march of uh, this year we will be transitioning into season 13. yes we've been doing this show coming 12 years going into season 13. we're now i think someone has claimed that we're like one of the longest Continuously produced podcasts in the history of podcasting. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It started off as an experiment. Talk about public failing because, you know, you choke, you have a snafu in the middle of a show. We're live on radio. So there's no mulligans. There's no do-overs. But I love doing the show. I love engaging with you on uh, getting your questions, getting your emails. So here's your opportunity. In celebration of season 13, for the for the month of January and February here of 2017. So if you're listening in within January, February of 2017, you can participate in this competition. If you're listening to this 
later on, months, years later, sorry, competition's already over. But here's the, here's the competition. The competition is go out and share what, are, what is that killer innovation that you are most excited about. Post it over on Twitter, post on Facebook. Make sure you like us, uh, you know, like, you know, Phil McKinney on Twitter, like Phil McKinney fan on, um, on Facebook. You can just go to Kill Innovations and click the, uh, the uh, social media buttons up the top. And f- so that way, that way it's easier for us to find it, find your postings. And then post the innovation that you are most excited about. Now it can be one, two, three, ten. You know, the number of your postings is limited by how much, uh, don't do repeats. Repeat, post your idea once and then post a different one, the one that you're excited about. And just give a little bit of a blurb on why you're excited about it. Coming into uh, first of March, we will go through all of those postings and we will randomly pick one to be the winner. And whoever the winner is, whoever posted that uh, that killer innovation up um, up out on social media for all for all of us to talk about and share, we're going to allow you to come onto the show. Now you can come live into the studio here in Colorado, or you can join us um, via Zoom and uh, participate. And therefore, you get to tell your story. You can tell us about your startup, this great idea that you've got. Um, uh, your frustrations with your anti corporate antibodies, people in your organization who are not letting you innovate, whatever it is, it's a one hour show within the reason that it's got to be tied to innovation, creativity, and design. And you get a chance to have an opportunity to talk to the entire listening audience. How do you do this? Post it on social media. Use the hashtag killer innovation, all one word, hashtag killer innovation. And uh, we'll track that. And for those that I find pretty intriguing, I'll comment on them and uh, share them out to our entire listener base. Uh, But here's your opportunity to tell your innovation story to a global audience of the show. So I'm looking forward to seeing those innovations that you are most excited and interested about and uh, to share those with the entire listening audience here at Kill Innovation. So again, find those innovations that you're most excited about. Post them out on social media. You can post them Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, whichever ones you're most interested in. Follow us on that on those areas. You know, on each of those social media, so I, that way I can find it more easily. Use the hashtag Killer Innovation. Post an image, post a video, whatever it is. Share with us what you think you're the number one most interested and in intriguing innovation should be. And so with that, we're going to wrap up this week's show. Uh, appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us um, here at Kill Innovations and uh, look forward to uh, seeing what innovations you're most excited about. You're listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. So, a couple of questions that are still out there on Facebook Live. One is I've heard conflicting reports on virtual reality causing eye problems and resolving them as well. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I did a lot of research in 3D and 3D glasses and goggles. Um, and roughly about 8 or 9% of, the, of uh, the population cannot use 3D goggles. Um, some people just cannot see in 3D. They have an eye problem with one eye. They don't see in 3D. Um, some just have uh, other issues that make it a challenge. Um, I haven't seen the research on virtual reality, VR goggles, AR goggles, et cetera. But given that you are dependent on a physical item projecting an image that the, that the eye has to perceive, um, I'm guessing there are going to be some people who just uh, don't, can't handle it. For instance, my wife can, is not big on going into movie theaters to use the passive 3D glasses because it gives her headaches. But here in our home, we have 3D TVs with what's called active shutter glasses, she's fine. She can watch those. So it, uh, it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it is interesting. Um, someone here has also commented on Vive uh, for the win. Uh, the HTC Vive actually is quite impressive um, with uh, its technology. I think we still got a couple more cycles of innovations that are going to occur in the AR, VR world. Um, it's one that is going to uh, uh, see some, uh, you know, pretty interesting transitions. And I also think we're going to see some companies just not make it. They're going to fail. They are going to uh, 
um, you know, gonna gonna get knocked out from the standpoint of uh, of um, uh, you know not be able to survive. Too much competition. The the investment cost is is escalating. You know, you're you know this is not this is not for the faint of heart or the startup world to uh, compete in the in the uh, virtual reality augmented reality. Another one is flying cars. Well, you know. <laughs> I grew up uh, watching Jetson, right? So I always dreamed, always wanted my uh, flying cars. But the, uh, you know, who was it? I think it was Darcy said, or not Darcy, somebody else said, you know, we were promised flying cars and we got, you know, 140 characters, Twitter. Uh, (laughs) As far as the level of innovation that we were getting, you know, a number of years back. Um, I think, I think flying cars could be interesting, but to be quite honest, I think, I am most excited about um, the uh, all of the new car technologies. You know, the self-driving vehicles are pretty interesting. In fact, my new vehicle, albeit it's not a full self-driving, it has an interesting reaction when I take my hands off the steering wheel to let it drive is I get a big display right in the middle of my dashboard telling me to put my hands uh, back on the steering wheel. So... But I tell you, I am getting spoiled by those kinds of technologies and ones that I would just really, I really hope for. Um, Okay, let's see. Athena says, Temple Grandin, if you're not familiar with Temple Grandin, uh, she's probably one of the, she's the most famous person diagnosed with autism. Um, And uh, we had a chance to spend uh, time with Temple with our work in hacking autism. Temple Grandin says, people of any age should only have an hour or less of screen time a day. Thoughts on that? Well, if that was truly the case, then I violate that. I'm violating that right now because I'm sitting here looking at two big 4K monitor displays right in front of me in my studio. So I'm sitting here for the last hour uh, looking at two large 4K screens for the studio. So from that standpoint, I violated that rule. Um, just in the last hour. Um, how important do you think it is to spend time daily in nature? How much time do you spend in nature? Well, it is. I mean, one of the reasons why I live in Colorado, um, and that is, is to get out and, uh, um, you know, enjoy nature, get out, natural light, exercise, all of those kinds of things. And look, I do it because of work, right? But even I find myself, I get so wrapped up. My wife does this retreat that she does every year where she goes away for seven days. No communications, no technology, nothing. And in fact, it's a silent retreat, so there's no talking um, during those retreat activities. It's kind of her opportunity to, to refresh. For me, I go on vacations where technology doesn't do me a lot of good. Right. So I did last year, I did an Atlantic crew crossing from Portugal to Fort Lauderdale. So seven days out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And I'm too much of a cheapskate to pay for the outrageously priced broadband on uh, on the ship. So I had seven days where I wasn't really when I was not really on the screen, but I was actually I'm working on I was working on my second book. So uh, I use it for writing, but it wasn't using it for, uh, you know, distraction, those kinds of things. And even then I limited myself to three hours of writing a day and then the rest of the time, you know, swimming in the pool or relaxing or what, you know, doing other stuff. So I do think it's important that you not, you know, everything in moderation and that includes technology and that, you know, so that includes the um, not doing anything too much, but I'm also, I'm not a, a person that says that something is quote bad for you. Um, that's self, you know, your self choice. Um, you can choose what it is you, you like, enjoy, get passionate about, but I do think everything in, uh, in moderation. So with that, we're going to wrap up, uh, today's show. We've been extending it here a little bit going off into Facebook, um, to answer some of the questions we've got during the show. Remember we're here each and every Sunday, um, live when we're in the studio live, uh, you can join us by Facebook. You can you can ask your questions. We'll tend to try to answer those questions during the um, uh, during the commercial break. Um, and just so you know, 
we have furniture on the way for the studio. So we're anxious for uh, all of that to uh, get put in place here and we can finish up uh, all the final layout for the studio. So again, thank you for taking the time. I'm really interested in your feedback. Hop over to killinnovations.com, check out the show notes, um, subscribe to the podcast over on iTunes and Google Play and um, you know umpteen number of other uh, podcast sites. You can pretty much find it or you can listen to it directly over on Killer Innovations. But give me some feedback. Let me know. We're doing the video work now, trying to give you a little bit more um, context and being able to more a little bit more show and not just tell around innovation. So uh, looking for uh, so your feedback, just drop me an email over at phil at killerinnovations.com. And with that, we're going to sign off, and uh, we will uh, we will be live here next Sunday. We actually have a very important announcement um, about the show next Sunday, not related to the contest, not related to season thirteen. Or actually, I get no excuse me. Two weeks from now, we're going to be making an important announcement. What's that? The fifteenth, I think. Um, you're not going to want to miss the January fifteenth show. We've got a big announcement we'll be making about Killer Innovations and the show and everything. So. Um, you're definitely going to want to be here for the show and listen to it live. With that, we're going to talk to you later. Bye-bye.